Uh, welcome. Shh. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Adam Smith Institute. If you have a mobile phone on you, would you put it to silent now, please? Um, the Adam Smith Institute is, of course, uh, a neoliberal think tank. And um, the head of that is uh, Dr. Manson Perry. Now, uh, we were, of course, to have uh, Sir John Redwood uh, as our freedom fighter today but he's uh, pinned down by parliamentary business. Uh, and uh, what we were going to do is to invite uh, Madsen to be our last one um, without telling him. Uh, and so uh, we were going to make that a surprise. But we've actually given him a double surprise because firstly, we, we're featuring him as one of our freedom fighters, our last freedom fighter indeed. And secondly, we're doing it a month ahead. Um, so he's uh, somewhat unprepared, as am I. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll, it's the normal uh, format. And uh, we'll start. Uh, Madsen, um, did you always believe in free markets and free choices? Or was there something that converted you? Was it a person or a book or something like mm. that, an incident? Uh, as, as a teenager, uh, I was rather in, in favor of um, beneficent government doing what was best for people. And then, I, I, sort of in my late teens, I, I worked out that I didn't want anyone doing what was best for me. So um, I, I sat down at the age of, I think, 22 and wrote down everything I believed in. You just kind of summed it up. I was deeply distressed when I discovered John Stuart Mill had done it 100 years earlier and done it a lot better than I did. <laughs> he did most things, uh, Otto Lee and the rest of us. Um, you, you started off really um, uh, doing philosophy and you, you published a book on the uh, philosophy of science. So what is it that sort of pulled you towards uh, policy work? Mm. I, I was, of course, a, a professor of philosophy at, at mm. Hillsdale, my most popular class which was on logical fallacies, later became a book. Uh, I will not mention its title because cheap advertising is not our style. Um, <laughs> it's called How to Win Every no, Argument. No, no. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Yeah, I wouldn't have said that myself. Um, the, the, the point was that um, Hillsdale, it, it, I loved it there. Uh, it's a jolly nice place, and it, it uh, gives it degrees. You know, uh, it, It's called a liberal arts college in America. It's fun fundamentally a university that doesn't do research. And uh, I wanted to step on a bigger stage. I could have stayed there all my life, and I wouldn't have changed the world. So I decided to move. Um, your background isn't typical of free marketeers. Well, maybe it is, I don't know. Your greatest, fa greatest fan, um, the political commentator Owen Jones, yes. um, <laughs> as he described it, uh, you were brought up by a grandmother who made fishing nets in the living room to support her family. So how influential was that on, on your outlook on life? Yeah, I never thought of myself as, as poor when I was a child. Um, I, the house I was brought up in, uh, my, grand, my mother died when I was two, so my grandmother had to bring up a second family. Um, um, the house had uh, no hot water, you know, had to go out into the garden to use the loo. You know, it, it would these days uh, be called working class if anyone had done any work. We just called it lower class. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I never gave it a thought. Children don't. They just accept what's, what's going, status quo, and don't, don't even think about it. Uh, I went to a grammar school, and that, that of course, changed things. Because uh, I, I received an, uh, an education, uh, a free state school, that enabled me to go to university. And that was the change. It wasn't my upbringing. It was my education. Would you like to resurrect the grammar schools? I, 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 the problem with the grammar schools is that they took 13% of the population and they threw away the other 87% in secondary modern schools. Originally, they were supposed to give an equivalent technical education, but they didn't, because all of the civil servants had been educated at top schools and universities, and they didn't really want resources wasted on, on uh, underachievers. Had the grammar schools you know, done maybe 50% of the population, I, I think you know, that would have been better. And talking about education and brain power, uh, you were, I think, secretary of Mensa? International Mensa? Yes, I was. Uh, for was, was, <coughs> was that a character building experience? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was certainly a, <coughs> a learning experience, yes. I did that for 13 years, and, and uh, finally I snuck out. 
Um, Mensa is an organization that's principally social. Um, the idea behind it is you meet people of, you can engage in arguments and meet a certain level of rationality. You don't meet flat earthers or people who think the moon landings were faked. You know, it, it, it's really at that level. And it was a very enjoyable experience. Yes, we, we built up Mensa from, I think, 1,500 members to just shy of 40,000. Um, you um, started life, really, as I, I hate to say this word, but you started as a Tory. Um, and you were a qualified uh, Tory election agent, um, presuming you ran campaigns, and then you became a Conservative city councillor in, in Edinburgh. So why did you never follow through with, with party politics? The first one, um, being a qualified uh, Tory election agent, um, gave me a lot of skills that, that about how to, how to run elections and how to win elections, um, which, you know, um, have proved invaluable uh, for me advising friends. The second one, being a councillor, persuaded me that I'm not cut out for elective office. You have to spend many hours listening to people talk about nothing at all, and then you have to vote like you're told. And I thought, no, no, that's not me. Other people, yes. Me, no. You've been through a lot of um, turbulent political times, though. Uh, what would be the most exciting moment that you would Can I have two? Okay. Okay. Because um, th th these were both, um, you know, game changers. Um, one was in um, 1979, when there was a vote of no confidence in the Labour government. And it was terribly exciting, because it went right down to the wire, and no one knew how it would go. And we all thought... Callaghan had won when he brought over the independent MP from Northern Ireland. Uh, but when it came to the vote, the guy stood by the speaker's chair and didn't go through either the door, yes or no. I came to abstain in person, he said. <laughs> wow, <laughs> very, very Irish, I thought. Uh, <clears throat> and when the result was announced that the government had lost the motion of no confidence, and Callaghan said, the House has given its verdict, we shall now take our case to the country. And we knew then we were going to get in, and we were going to transform Britain. So that was very exciting. The other one was in 1989. Late night program, there'd been demonstrations in the streets in Berlin, and uh, the program was just about to finish, and the cameraman walked in, you know, carrying a, a rock, you see? And the presenter said, what's this? What's going on here? And he said, it's the wall. They're taking it down. And he dumped it on the table with a big thunk. And we all knew then that the communist evil empire was finished. That was very exciting. Uh, you came back to the UK from America. You joined the brain drain, uh, as did my brother Stuart. And uh, both of you came back at the same time to found the Alsford Institute. I joined a little later. Um, what was it that you were really trying to achieve? How did you think it would work out? Oh yes, in, in the 1970s, Britain was you know on it, on the ropes. You know, it, it really was. You know. Uh, it was just a dreadful time, um, strikes and power cuts and shortages of toilet paper and sugar. I mean, we were like Venezuela, you know, <laughs> not quite, but it was getting that way. Um, and, and we'd seen most of these problems solved elsewhere in the world, and, and we wanted to, to found a new type of think tank. Now, the IA was already here, advocating sound economics you know, brilliantly and successfully. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to go for policy. We wanted to devise policies that would um, fundamentally um, take out the interest groups that opposed it. Uh, Buchanan had published public choice theory as to why bureaucrats and politicians you know, fundamentally oppose what you try to do, because it's not in their self-interest. We wondered if we could make it in the self-interest of groups. Could you devise policies that took on board all of the interest groups by putting in something for them so they would freely support it? And we did. You've been on BBC Question Time three times. Is that a nerve-wracking thing to do? Yes, it was terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's completely frightening to, to, to realize you're going in front of an audience of, what, 8 million, is it, or something? It, it was then. Uh, <coughs> um, it, is, it is awesomely frightening. You realize one slip and you're, you're ruined forever. You'll be a laughing stock throughout history. Yes, it, uh, but we, we, I prepared for it. You know, we, we spent a whole week with video cameras, uh, uh, mock questions, you know, practicing, looking over my, my uh, uh, answers and so on, working out how it should be improved and so on. You, you always know roughly what's... By the way, the questions are 
<coughs> on question time, you, you, you're not told in advance. But you can work out, because obviously they're the stuff that's been going on during the week. Uh, there's always one wild card question that you, you simply, you have to be quick-witted quick to deal with that one. Um, yeah, it, it was completely terrifying. Um, all I can say is, is that, you know, I, I stopped drinking for a week beforehand. I mean, that really shows you how unusual it was. And uh, it, it, it took me about, you know, a day and a half to recover afterwards. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> a quick question round. Beer or wine? Oh, wine, of course, yes. Love it. Uh, red, obviously. And New World Red, yes. Okay. Favorite snack? Cheese. I drink about, uh, sorry, I drink about 1% of Britain's wine consumption. I eat about 5% of Britain's cheese consumption. Uh, favorite wine bar where you can get this wine? Oh, the cork, the cork and bottle. <coughs> At which institution much of the Thatcher revolution was plotted without the left ever knowing that. Uh, what's your idea of a perfect holiday if you ever take holiday, which I'm not sure you do? <coughs> yes, I do. Uh, only um, at New Year in the Florida Keys. I like to spend New Year in t-shirt, shorts, and sandals, drinking a rum runner, and as midnight approaches, watching uh, on a, at a tiki bar, watching a TV screen of 600,000 New Yorkers shivering their butts off in Times Square. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect holiday. All right, what about Britain? Uh, do you like uh, parts of Britain? Well, St. Andrews, for sentimental reasons, which I'm sure you share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sports, do you follow any sports? Do you have any sports? I don't do any sports. Uh, you play chess, don't you? I did, I don't know. Um, uh, I suppose I, I, the, what, I follow football managers, you know. Um, I, I kind of, when Jose Mourinho became manager of Chelsea, I switched my allegiance from Manchester United to Chelsea, simply because, you know, I like the manager. And uh, so d d I don't watch the sports. I do look at the results. Now, in a long and, some people think, too long a life, Mm. You uh, have met. <laughs> but certainly Owen Jones probably thinks that. <laughs> That's who I had in mind. Um, you have met uh, many leading liberals of the 20th and 21st century. Which of them would you admire most? As oh, as individuals? there were two uh, uh, Friedrich Hayek and Karl Popper. And uh, people say, uh, who, who was. Who was, who was the shopper? Who was it? And my answer is, um, I, I knew them both. Um, Popper was the, the cleverer in the sense that he had a logical, linear mind, and he was very, very fast. He could get straight to the conclusion. Uh, Hayek was the wiser of the two, a kind of different type of intellect. You, you'd ask Hayek a question, and he'd pause for a moment and think about it, and then with immense courtesy, he'd bring in so much knowledge into his answer, you felt you'd receive the definitive wisdom. <laughs> Um, what do you think has been the Antwerp Institute's uh, greatest achievements and biggest uh, mess-ups? Ooh, greatest achievement. Um, it wasn't any individual policy. It, it was um, probably the fact that we beat the drum so remorselessly for free enterprise and free choices. We were there on television every day. We were on radio. We were in the newspapers. Every, we just hammered the message home. And eventually, along with the IEA, the CPS, and others, we won that ideological battle. Oh, God, I fear it might have to be won again. But, you know, it, it will be our successors at the Adam Smith Institute that have to win it. Yes, our greatest, um, uh, what's the term, uh, failure was probably, we published Douglas Mason's proposal for a, for a poll tax, right? And it, it was uh, implemented without Douglas's caveats. He said, first of all, you must freeze council spending so they don't jack it up under the cover of the changeover. Secondly, you can't charge students and unemployed people because they don't have any money. And the government went ahead and charged the unemployed and the students, and they, they didn't put a cap on spending. Uh, <coughs> the, the main disadvantage of the poll tax, in retrospect, was there was no one to collect it. You, you see, um, most taxes are collected by unpaid workers. Uh, uh, income tax is collected by your employers and sent off to the treasury. Uh, VAT is collected by shop assistants and restaurateurs. You see. Y you've got unpaid people collecting. There was no one to collect the poll tax. They had to appoint a whole new army of people to assess how much people needed to pay and to go around and make sure they paid it. And that made it actually a very inefficient tax. And in retrospect, you know, had I known then, I, I would have put those caveats into Douglas's publication. 
You've made some rather sensational political bets, including predicting that Arnold Schwarzenegger would become governor of California, even though he wasn't actually in politics at the time. Correct, yes, that was four years earlier. But what is the secret of your success? Oh, it, it's a combination of um, you know, looking at what you think might happen combined with what you'd like to happen. And when the two coincide, you bet, you see. And I told that to someone, I said, you, you, you want to bet on Donald Trump, you bet on him in May, even before he was a Republican candidate. Did you actually want Trump to win? I said, no, I wanted Hillary Clinton to lose. <laughs> <laughs> You're fascinated with rockets and interplanetary flights. Oh, yes. How does that manifest? Oh, since, since a child, yes. I was always, you know, I read Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, in the Eagle comic. Um, I was the first person in Britain to sign up and pay money for a private space flight. I was, this was last century. I was told, oh, it'll be at least two years before we get the equipment to do it. Guess what they're saying? It'll be two years before you... Know, every single year they say, oh, it'll be... You, Virgin Galactic was founded in, I think, 2004, and he said, oh, it's going to be two years. Guess what he's saying now? It's always going to be two years. So, you know, right. Uh, I did go to see uh, two uh, Soyuz rocket launches in Kazakhstan, which had the great advantage is that I met several billionaires, including uh, the founders of Google, uh, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft. Uh, all these people are boys, you see. They, they love rockets going, on, like me. You know. And um, so, so I, I got to meet lots of people simply by watching Soyuz rockets take off in Kazakhstan. Well, I hope you got a donation out of them. Uh, <coughs> I'm afraid not. No. <laughs> <laughs> not really at the appropriate time. Um, uh, you uh, proposed some years ago under, I think, John Major's uh, administration that uh, if you get services from the state, you should... Uh, have exactly the same rights as if you were buying them from a, a commercial firm. And you said there should be, um, or it became, the, what was known as the Citizens Charter, which uh, gave uh, we as taxpaying consumers the same sort of rights as uh, taxpaying customers would have. Do you think in the long term that has actually produced um, much that's, that's worthwhile? It, it did for a time. And it produced um, a culture change that has lasted. My theory was, you know, you, you buy a jumper from Marks and M&S, and if it's no good, you get your money back. You buy an education from the state, and if it's no good, you don't get your money back. You buy a health service from the state, and if it's no good, you don't get your money back. So um, my thing was, the public sector should be liable, as the private sector, to deliver the goods or make a, a compensation. And, and um, so now, you know, when so many of your trains are late uh, over a period, you, you get um, a refund on your season ticket and things like that. You know. the, the notion is basically something has to happen. Um, um, in, in the NHS, uh, specialists would have all of their appointments at 3 o'clock and they'd have 15 people lined up and then they'd see them one at a time. No. no you give people an appointment time and, and you, you keep it. And if you don't, you apologize. That's a, most people just want an apology. They don't want money. Um, but the idea that the public sector is obliged to deliver what you have paid for and what it has promised was the culture change. And I think some of that still survives. I mean, Tony Blair abolished this decision charter. But that culture thing, that we are being paid by the public to deliver something, and we damn well ought to deliver it. I explained to my American relatives, actually, that uh, when the train stops and uh, an announce, the driver announces oh, I'm stopped at a red light, I, uh, terribly sorry, yeah. moving on shortly, <laughs> uh, that we actually have you to thank for that. Yeah, we don't, well, not, not just me, but the citizens' charge. Because they, yeah. never, they never used to yeah, correct. make any announcements Absolutely. before then. You'd wait for half an hour, 40 minutes, without <laughs> knowing what was going on. Exactly. Um, we talked about the Berlin Wall. You, were, you took a team to uh, Poland, I think, uh, before the war, that wall had actually come down. Uh, to do some yeah. TV shoots on were you globalization. Not, were you not there yourself? No, I wasn't. Oh, okay. Not at that time. No. Okay. No, um, I just thought, what was that like? Was that well, what, what actually happened was, was that in, before the Berlin Wall came down, before the end of the evil empire, um, uh, General Jaruzelski in Poland <coughs> ha had been obliged to, to hold elections. But he carefully rigged it so, so that um, the communists w would end up in a majority. So the, the, the Union Solidarity was only allowed to contest fewer than half the seats. Um, unfortunately for him, Solidarity in the summer won all of the seats <laughs> that they contested. Um, and then the Farmers' Party 
which the communists had relied on as their coalition partners, promptly switched sides. So you had a non-communist government in Poland, and they invited the Adam Smith Institute over to teach them about privatization. And so in September, we went over and were met by guards with submachine guns at the airport. And it, it, you know, it, it, it was um, quite tense, shall we say. Fortunately, we, we took the um, precaution of taking a team from the dispatches, Channel 4 dispatches program with us to film it. And they were there with their TV cameras filming these guards with some machine guns. And I said, I'm surprised they gave you permission. We didn't ask, they said. <laughs> um, yes, it, it, was, it was quite an eye-opening experience. I realized, by the way, at that point that the West had won, that the Cold War was over and that we'd won. And that was uh, two, three months before the Berlin Wall came down. It was quite obvious then. What advice would you give uh, young people thinking of going into a political career? Oh, the same as Nigel Lawson said. I interviewed him um, a few months ago here, and um, I asked him that very question. And he said, do something else first. Achieve something else in life. Don't go into Parliament having been a parliamentary assistant, special advisor, and nothing in the real world. Go, you know, hold down a job. Bring to Parliament some experience of the real world. And I would add something t to what Nigel Lawson said. I would say go and make some money if you can. And if you go into Parliament with a little bit of money, you are independent. Now, uh, an MP who was a member of our next generation group, I will not name him, um, uh, made his, uh, <coughs> his uh, money and went into Parliament. And the whip said, you better vote for us tonight, or there'll be no question of a government job for you. And he said, look, I make more money in a week than your job pays in a year, so piss off and don't ever bother me again. And they never did. So you do, you do acquire a certain degree of independence if you've got some resources. Why aren't you on Twitter? Oh, I can't stand the abuse. I, I just, I'm busy. I don't want to have to think about that every day. Really, I don't. I, I, if I had to deal with that kind of abuse and stuff, I, I'd never get anything done. Right? We live, as they say, in interesting times. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Oh, yes, I'm an optimist. Um, oh, I'm, I'm with Julian Simon, the, the, the ultimate resource is human ingenuity and creativity. We can solve any problem. Uh, we're going to solve the environmental problems, we're going to solve political problems, because we're clever. That's what people are, that's what people do. So yes, I'm an opt I'm probably the most optimistic person you have ever met. And you have met Julian Simon. Okay. There you go. So yes, it's all going to be fine. And it won't be fine because it turns out fine. It'll be fine because we make it fine. Dr. Madison Perry? Freedom Fighter, thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. You guys will give a nice little token of appreciation to oh, wow. these fighters. And well, this is your favorite thing in the world. So, uh, it is, yes. Uh, a nice 20-year wow. Madeira for that. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned, but there is plenty of refreshment downstairs. Thank and you very much. And the speaker will remain behind to answer any of your questions. Yes. Sir.